Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to see you this morning. You've all got a seat, and uh, uh, I've got my coffee as well, so I've got my coffee, and I can listen to Andrew, so coffee and Bible reading, Bible teaching, what a wonderful combination, wonderful combination. Uh, we were thrilled uh, yesterday um, with uh, Elijah and some familiar passages that we saw afresh. And we're moving from Elijah into Elisha today. And so I'm just going to pray as we, uh, as we start that God would open our eyes and we would hear great things from his word. Psalm 119, verse 18 says this. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And as we heard uh, last night, um, the eyes and the ears are connected to the heart. Yeah. Lord, as we hear, we pray that our hearts would be softened we would receive your word, we would believe it, and it would produce the fruit of righteousness that you long for in this nation and indeed all the nations. Lord, yeah. may what we hear today not simply satisfy our minds, but affect the churches and the people that we know, and indeed the gospel uh, work that we we might support lord teach us we pray when we say open our ears and eyes and hearts yeah. we mean it and we pray it in jesus name amen amen thanks very much steve um thanks for coming back or welcome to anyone who's here for the first time We've got um, lots to do today again. We're going to be busy. Um, let's just start with a bit of revision from yesterday, and we'll revise by means of going through the first two verses of the rap. Okay, so... <laughs> when the people had an evil king, they worshipped Baal, a terrible thing. God said, he's a fake, but if you're in doubt, let's see which of us can end the drought. Or if you prefer, light a barbecue. What's wrong, Bob? Are you sleeping? Have you gone to the loo? When the people see the fire, they exclaim, the Lord, he is God, and it starts to rain. Ahab and Jezebel won't repent, so miserable Elijah to sign I sent. But God's not in earthquake, fire or wind. No more second chances, that's how bad they sinned. Instead, God dispatches the assassins, three, but tells us 7,000 who ain't bowed the knee. Okay, so that's where we got to. And here's my question for you. Um, you'll, you hopefully you'll know it by the end of the, this week. It'll be going over in your head like it is in mine constantly. Um, here's the question of revision. Um, Steve mentioned that we're getting on to Elisha today. Actually, we're not, we'll mainly get on to him, when is it, Thursday. But we have actually already had a mention of Elisha. And see if you can turn to your neighbour and remind them where. So Elisha has already turned up in the narrative, but where? So just turn to your neighbour, see if you can remember. Okay, that's enough time. If you know, you know. Any volunteers? Where have we met Elisha already? He's one of the assassins, exactly. Yes, yeah, so in 1 Kings 19, do you remember? Um, the people have broken God's covenant and Elijah complains to God. They've forsaken your covenant, which is true. They've broken down your altars. They've killed your prophets. I'm the only one left. It's all true. And God agrees with Elijah... And he says, enough's enough. Uh, Elijah goes to the mountain of the covenant, Mount Sinai, 
hoping perhaps for another chance, a, a renewal of the covenant, but this time it doesn't come. God isn't in the earthquake. God's not in the fire. He's not in the wind. Instead, a... Uh, which is a very chilling silence, I think. And God said, send the assassins. The three of them, Hazael, um, king of Syria, Jehu, king of Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, as the prophet. They are the three assassins. And you need to keep that in mind because we're not going to say much about them today, but the overall big story arc of Elijah and Elisha, we'll come back to it um, tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, on Thursday and Friday, and we'll see how that story of Elisha the assassin continues with unexpected twists. But for now, I want us to pick up this quite big theme of 1 and 2 Kings, which is that God says things a long time before they happen. And particularly that's true of God's word of judgment. So God announces judgment long before judgment is experienced. That's God's kindness, isn't it? To give a warning. It's like with Jonah, sent him to Nineveh, says... In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. You know, a, um, a cruel God would just come and destroy Nineveh, but a gracious and merciful God gives 40 days' notice of destroying Nineveh, and it gives them time to repent. And well, it's the same here, that God gives the warning of judgment before judgment actually comes. But the trouble about that is, or the challenge of that is, that, well, who's to say that it's really true? Because, you know, judgment's not here. I mean, we, we read in the New Testament that God has set a day on which he'll judge the world in justice, but you know, how do we know it's not here? How do we know that God cares about people turning away from him? You know, no lightning bolts from heaven. Maybe God doesn't mind. At least that's the attitude, isn't it, of the scoffer. And people say, where is this coming that he promised? 2 Peter chapter 3. You know, ever since the beginning of creation, things have been just going on um, year on year as they were before. So the trouble about a judgment that's in the future, all we've got to go on is God's word for it. The judgment's not here, it's just a threat that it will come. Well, in 1 and 2 Kings, I think one of the big themes of the book, of the, the two books, the, the one book together... One of the big themes is that what God says will happen. And so when God announces something, even if it's long in advance, you'd be advised to take it seriously. And I want to show you a couple of examples just that we missed yesterday, um, and then we'll, we'll spend most of our time in 1 Kings 22 and in 2 Kings 1, and we'll see that same lesson twice. But just yesterday, do you remember we began at the end of 1 Kings 16, and we'll turn back there. And I skipped over a verse. Um, it's good to be on your lookout, by the way, for when preachers do that. Don't let me get away with that, and don't let your pastor get away with that. And I was talking to somebody um, earlier today, and they, they were talking about hearing on, I think, on the radio, and there was a reading from 1 Corinthians um, chapter 6, and there's a list of sins in that chapter, um, including some that we don't consider mentionable on the radio nowadays. And as they heard the list, the person reading it had just edited it and just snipped out the words that would cause offence and carried on. And I was in St Paul's Cathedral several years ago. I heard a, a reading from Romans chapter 1. It was the same. And because I know Romans chapter 1, I noticed that there were some words that they didn't read. So just be on the lookout for that. You know, we don't want edited Bibles. We want the whole thing. I snipped out a verse yesterday and you didn't pick me up on it. So be, watch out this time. So um, 1 Kings 16, verse 29. We saw this yesterday and we'll go for the verse that we missed out as well. So 1 Kings 16, verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king over Israel. He reigned in, Sam in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Do you remember his first entry in the Guinness Book of Records? The most evil king. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, um, the king that put the two golden calves um, in Israel, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. He began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal. 
that he built in Samaria, Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. Chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there'll be no rain. I've done it again, right? I've done it again. Uh, So why do we get, in between the description of Ahab's idolatry, worshipping a storm god, and then God's announcement in judgment of the drought, why do we get chapter 16, verse 34? Chapter 16, verse 34. In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, the son of Nun. I mean, what's that about? It seems like a very random idea. It's just, you know, here's this in other news, you know, and and then we hear the story of Heel, of Bethel, and this tragedy, this terrible personal tragedy in his family where he loses two of his children in building the city of Jericho. One of them when they start building, one of them when they finish building. Why are we told that? Well, there's a clue because the, the author tells us that this happened in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, I'm pleased he told me that because I otherwise wouldn't have known because I don't know Joshua well enough to know that in Joshua chapter 6, verse 26, just as they've destroyed the city of Jericho, Joshua says this, Joshua 6, 26, cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest son, he will set up its gates. Now, I didn't know that, but the author of 1 and 2 Kings is imagining that maybe I'd forgotten that, maybe you'd forgotten that, and so he just tells us, this is what Joshua had spoken. And so, you know, I went back into Joshua and found the cross-reference, and I read it, and I thought, wow, God predicted this actually hundreds of years beforehand. So long ago that almost everyone's forgotten that God ever said it. Except God hadn't forgotten that he said it. And everything that God promised will come to pass. In fact, it's not just sort of generally true. It's not like one of those, you know, Nost- those Nostradamus prophecies people get really excited about and Nostradamus says something really vague and mostly unrelated. And people say, oh my goodness, it's COVID. And it, you know, it's not really COVID, it's something... It's very, very unspecific. It's like the way horoscopes work. You know, horoscopes tell you um, you will experience an unusual surprise. I mean, you know, most weeks something surprising happens to you. So it's so vague that it's almost guaranteed to work. This isn't vague. This is about the city of Jericho. It's about two sons that you will lose if you rebuild it in this particular order. The firstborn when you start the city. The youngest when you finish the city. And that is what happens... Exactly. Now, why are we being told that here? Well, it's just before Elijah pronounces a word of judgment. It's not going to rain. And the question is, why, why should you take that kind of announcement seriously? I mean, I could say that today, couldn't I? I look out the window, I see it's very sunny, and I say, it's not going to rain today. And you say, wow, you know, we've got a prophet yeah, it's, not, it's not very impressive, is it, to look out the window on a sunny day and announce that it's a sunny day. Why should I take this seriously? Well, of course, as time goes on, we discover that Elijah's words are really powerful. I mean, it doesn't rain for six months, and a year, two years, three years, three and a half years, no rain. And as time goes on, you realise it was real. But at the time it's announced, you see, all you've got to go on is God's word for it. And so 1 Kings gives you this little flashback and said, do you remember Joshua, hundreds of years beforehand, said something, and it's just come true. You might want to bear that in mind as you hear the next thing that God says. And, um, well, God's already said something here in 1 Kings 19. He said, the assassins are coming. Hazael, king of Syria, Jehu, king of Israel, Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, as prophet. They are going to bring God's judgment. And you might want to take that seriously, because when God says something, 
it is going to happen. That's the, the theme of today's studies. And I think it's a big theme of One Two Kings. It happens actually many other places I haven't got time to show you. But we're going to spend most of our time just in these two, in 1 Kings 22 and then in uh, 2 Kings chapter 1. Um, and um, I want us to you know, slow down, look carefully at these narratives, but this is going to be the point, that what God says is going to happen. I've called it the unstoppable word. And again, if you've got the handout um, in front of you, it will help you. If you haven't got the handout, do go onto the seminar page later and download it and get a summary of where we've been. I'm going to read half of 1 Kings chapter 22 now. Um, but as I read it, See if you can spot the repeated question and the opposite answers. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. Listen out for the repeated question and the opposite answers. 1 Kings chapter 22. For three years there was no war between Aram and Israel, but in the third year Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel had said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And yet we're doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram. So he asked Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people as your people, my horses as your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord... So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, isn't there any longer a prophet of the Lord here who we can inquire of? The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, well, there is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imla. The king shouldn't say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, bring Micaiah, son of Imla, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Keniah, had made iron horns and he declared, this is what the Lord says, with these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The messenger who'd gone to summon Micaiah said to him, look, the other prophets, without exception, are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? Micah continued, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead? and going to his death there. One suggested this, another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked. I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. 
So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Kaniah, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you, he asked. Micaiah replied, you will find out on the day when you go to hide in an inner room. Then the king of Israel ordered, take Micaiah, send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king of king's son, and say, this is what the king says, put this fellow in prison. Give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah declared, if you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, mark my words, all you people. And I'm going to start reading there on the kind of cliffhanger, what's going to happen next. Da, da, da. And he, you probably know, but we'll stop there. So um, did you spot the repeated question and the two answers? Well, I've called this chapter, The Prophet Who Refused to Scratch Where They Itch. And I'm taking that title, you probably know from 2 Timothy, where Paul warns Timothy that the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Um, Some years ago, I um, I had to go to a series of lectures to prepare for ministry in the Church of England. And they were pretty terrible, actually. Um, They were hosted at St Paul's Cathedral, and um, mostly they were led by people who didn't believe the Bible. And it was very frustrating, and it was sort of how many heresies can we cram into a lecture each week? So it was very annoying. And sort of to comfort me, (laughs) when I went home, like in a rage after this, my housemate at the time, Richard, um, he suggested that we develop a... um, Um, a jewellery range of thank you gifts that I could present to the the speakers. And um, he had um, millstone cufflinks (laughs) (laughs) and um, itching ear-scratching earrings. I mean, it's obviously just being stupid, but, you know, we were really lamenting the the teaching. But that's the warning, isn't it, that people will choose to hear what they want to hear rather than what's true. And I think that's what this chapter is actually about. Here's the question that comes twice. If you've got the hand up, I've put it in a table. It comes in verse 6. Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? It comes again identically in verse 15. Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or not? It's the same question. It's the question that the whole chapter hinges on, and there's two different answers to the question. So all of the many prophets, they say, yes, you should go. Go, they answered. The Lord will give it into the king's hand. And then um, my favourite one is Zedekiah, son of Kaniah, who, he doesn't just say go, he actually does the full West End musical version of go by making himself props of iron horns and then, you know, he performs it and this is what, and I know it looks ridiculous but I presume it did look quite ridiculous this is how you will drive the Arameans um, out so they kind of go, go for it and then this lone voice Micaiah who, whose first answer slightly confuses us, we'll come back to that in a minute but his second answer, his fuller answer is you're going to die if you go Uh, You're going to be defeated. Uh, You're going to be killed. So the same question, two answers. And so really the the question is, which one is true? Is it true that the battle will be a success? Or is it true that the battle will be a defeat? That's the central question. I guess that's the question before any battle, isn't it? You don't go into battle if you think you're going to lose. So he's weighing up the question. Um, A true answer and a false answer. But here's my suggestion, and I want us to look at this closely. I suggest that actually the choice is not between the true and the false, although it is that, but it's a choice between what is true and what Ahab knows to be false but would like to be true. That's the choice. 
And I suggest that there is no point in the chapter at which there is any doubt about which is true. At every point, Ahab knows which is the right answer, but prefers the other answer that he knows is wrong. So it's it's the triumph of kind of wishful thinking, of itching ears over truth. Um, And what I want you to do is to find that. So um, we're going to look at it ourselves or in pairs, or if you're watching online, then um, on your own or with someone in your house. Um, We're going to look at the whole chapter and up to verse 28, and I want you to find... Um, places where it's obvious which is true. And there's all sorts of clues as we go through. If I, I'll give you the first one. Um, it's a, this is a subtle one, but shall we go to read Moth Gilead again or not? Verse 6. The king of Israel brought together the prophets, 400 men. Shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? And they say go. I suggest the first clue is the number 400. Why is 400 people saying yes a little bit troubling? This is quite a subtle one. Why should we be troubled by 400 prophets saying yes? 400 were killed by a previous prophet. Uh-huh. So some people died earlier, about 430 of them. But who were the people who were killed? Prophets of Baal, exactly. The number 400, 430, it kind of has connotations, right? But also, since when did it take God more than one prophet to say something true? So, I mean, you just think of that, really the whole Old Testament narrative until now. You know, Moses, there's only one Moses. Um, Samuel, there's only one Samuel. And Nathan, just one Nathan. I mean, always it's just one. There's only one Elijah. But, you know, you only need one person to tell you the truth. Why do you need 400 people? Well, 400 people is better if you want to try and persuade yourself of something that you know is not true. You know, safety in numbers, gather a crowd, lots of experts. A, a single voice will tell you the truth, but 400 is, is easier if you're trying to persuade yourself of something. So I suggest even that first question, it's kind of obvious there's something fishy going on. And then Jehoshaphat's answer makes it even clear, doesn't he? Verse 7, Jehoshaphat sees straight through it, these 400 prophets, and he goes rather pointedly, yeah, thanks everyone, but I was wondering whether there was a prophet of the Lord, which is quite pointed, as in, whoever these 400 people are representing, it is not Yahweh. I guess they're 400 prophets of Baal, probably. And he just wants one prophet of Yahweh. So even at the beginning, it's obvious to Jehoshaphat. Um, Do you remember I said yesterday... South of the border is more um, orthodox, more sound. South of the border is um, Judah, where the temple is in Jerusalem, where the king is in the line of David. Jehoshaphat is king of Judah. So Jehoshaphat is not as dodgy as Ahab. So that's why he's kind of saying, come on a minute, you know, be good to ask the Lord, and I'm not so sure about these 400. Okay, so that's scene one. But I want you to look through the rest of the narrative and look for clues at each point that Ahab actually knows what is true, but is trying to suppress it. Okay, so see if you can find evidence in the chapter that Ahab knows what's true. He knows Micaiah is the one speaking the truth, but he tries to suppress it. And, and there's all sorts of different reasons and, um, in the chapter. See what you can find, and then we'll feed back in a few minutes. So off you go. Um, maybe they all go through in order. So some people start at the end, some people start in the middle, just so we... Between us, we get a range of answers. Let me interrupt, and hopefully we can, we can pull our answers. So, any clues that Ahab knows which of them is true? Micaiah versus the others. Yes, sir. In verses 15 and 16, he accuses Micaiah of lying when he says what the others are saying. Yes, thank you. That's a very perceptive answer. This is the biggest puzzle for me of the chapter when I first, well, not just when I first, when I second, third, fourth, for a lot of times reading it, I was stuck on this. If Micaiah is representing the Lord, and he even says, I'm not bound to peer pressure, he says, you know, um, what the Lord gives me, that is what I'm going to speak. So, you know, when they try and heavy him, come on, Micaiah, you know, be a good chap, agree with everyone else, don't rock the boat. He says rather bravely, 
Um, and I can imagine this being the kind of verse that preachers would pin on their pulpits. Maybe some people have done. Um, he says, verse 14, as surely as the Lord lives, I can say only what the Lord tells me. And that's a great verse for a preacher, isn't it? So you think, well done, Micah, you know, you're an evangelical hero. And then when he's asked the question, he bottles it. And he goes along with the 400. And you think, oh, Micaiah, what are you doing? How could you let us down so quickly? But actually, I think Micaiah's being quite sneaky. Because he, he smokes Ahab out, you might say. He, he causes Ahab to reveal his hand. I don't know whether he says it in a kind of sarcastic way. Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead or shall we refrain? Oh, yes, go. You'll be so successful. I'm sure you'll be very successful there. And then Ahab says, look, tell me the truth. And then, you know, the cat's out the bag, isn't it? Well, you know it's not the truth then, do you, Ahab? I mean, Ahab at that point has basically admitted that he knows all the 400 prophets are liars. So I think it's Micaiah being very tactical, very, very shrewd. Oh, you want to know the truth, he says, and then tells them the truth. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, yeah, we had a hand over there and then a hand over there. So over here, sir. Yeah, yeah. You don't get tone of voice, do you? But I think you can, you can infer that from the way that um, the, the Ahab re- reacts to it. Thank you. At the back. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking that maybe it's not so much my client being tactical, but God's God. He wants to say, I have made up. Are you really um, listening to the truth? Or are you going to just go and do whatever you want to hear? It's a sort of set and stay. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think basically it's God's at work and God's at work. I think, my, personally, I think that Micah is being faithful, yes. um, sort of consciously, but he gives the wrong answer as a test. As you say, the Lord is testing Ahab by that. Thank you very much. Um, yes? Um, the fact that uh, um, Ahab doesn't like Micah because he always tells him bad things, as if a prophet is there to just <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm going to repeat it just for those who are um, watching afterwards. So um, the gentleman said, um, his cri- Ahab's criterion for selecting a prophet is who says nice things about me. That is not a good criteria for truth-telling. No. So he's looking for flatterers rather than for truth-speakers. And he, I mean, the fact he says it twice, you know, well, there's one guy we could ask, but I hate him because he always says bad things. And then when... Micah delivers his prophecy. I mean, Ahab sounds like a child, doesn't he? See, told, I, mean, I told you, this is what I said. You know, he's always saying bad things, like a child in a, in a sock. And I mean, I think, sadly, um, you do sometimes find that in churches where people don't like their pastor because he, he says the hard things. He talks about God's judgment, this pastor. We don't like that. Um, I remember years ago, um, I... I preached to a friend, he was, um, to give him a holiday, he was a um, pastor of this church and I, I went to cover a couple of weeks. He was quite new and, and the church hadn't been evangelical previously and I'm, I went to fill in and I preached on, I can't remember, a psalm or something and afterwards um, someone in the congregation came up to me and, and sort of congratulated me in a very flattering way, he said, thank you so much for that sermon, vicar. You know, we don't hear much preaching like that anymore in this church. Um, and he's sort of puffing me up. He says, you see, because our new vicar, I mean, all he ever does is speak about Jesus. But we did enjoy your sermon. <laughs> so, so I was somewhat crushed by that. And I, I passed it on for the encouragement of the vicar, who I thought would be quite pleased. But, you know, I don't like this new vicar because all he ever does is speak about you know, judgment or sin or, you know, these negative things. But, my, you know, Ahab, he looks very foolish. That, if that's his criterion for choosing who to hear, he just wants flattery. Thank you very much. Any others? There's more. Yes, thank you. When the messenger goes to Sullivan, he tells him what he meant to say. 
Yeah, that's the puzzle, isn't it? The fact that Micaiah initially says what everybody else says. And that's what, that's what I was saying earlier. I think that's a kind of test, because it's not really the truth. And Ahab knows that. And then Micaiah gives him the actual truth. Well, I saw Israel scattered um, like sheep without a shepherd. Yeah. Um, someone over here... Okay, yeah, yeah, so the civil service comes to you and says, you know, this is what we expect you to say, make sure you toe the line, there'll be consequences for you if you don't, um, and of course by the end of the chapter there are consequences, he's thrown into prison, given bread and water, um, smacked on the face by um, our western musical friend Zedekiah, Steve. Yeah, that's- Yes, so an alliance, and I mean, Jehoshaphat, as we'll see shortly, is I think the most gullible man in the Bible. We'll see why uh, in a little bit. But yeah, he gets somebody more orthodox to side with him to ease his conscience. Um, let, let me just pull in a couple of other ones. Um, this is the trickiest bit, I think, when Micaiah gives a fuller vision of what's going on in verse 19. And it's a really fascinating prophecy because it. He reveals a reality, a spiritual reality, that is unseen, but a kind of exact copy of what is going on on earth. So on earth, at this point, verse 10, dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, are sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor, and prophets are coming before them. So you've got two thrones, and then all these prophets coming before them. Meanwhile, in heaven... The Lord is on his throne, and loads of people are coming up before him. So it's this sort of parallel, unseen um, reality where everything's really going on. And um, God invites suggestions about how to entice Ahab. And the, the verb entice is interesting, isn't it? How do we put something so juicy in front of him that he can't resist it? And there's various suggestions. And then one spirit says... I'll entice him by being a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Now, this is tricky because I, I take it that this is a, an evil spirit. It's a lying spirit. It's not, a, it's not the spirit of God who is the spirit of truth. And this is a, um, a wicked spirit. And yet, we see here, as we see in the book of Job, that God is in charge of the whole heavenly core. And even evil spirits, lying spirits, are subject to God's authority. So they have to, you know, ask permission, as, as Satan has to do in Job. You know, I'd like to inflict suffering on Job. Am I allowed to, please? So um, it's a similar picture here. The, this evil spirit volunteers, and God says, okay, you can do it. And people find that quite troubling. Why would God allow an evil spirit to deceive people? But I think here's, for me, this is the solution to it. Yeah, I mean, God does allow that. But then God also, through his true prophet, by the Holy Spirit, then tells Ahab about the plan. So it's not a very secret conspiracy. (laughs) It's like um, Micaiah says, oh, you should know that there's been a secret meeting about you in heaven. And um, God's told me to publish the minutes of that secret meeting. And basically what happened was he was looking for someone to deceive you because you're so gullible Um, Someone volunteered to, he was evil, God said okay, and they said it's probably going to work. Just thought you'd like to know. So, I mean, Ahab has every opportunity, not only does he hear the deceiving words, but he knows they are deceiving words, he knows they come from an evil spirit, and he knows they're for his destruction, because God has told him all of that. So to go against it now, I mean, you've really got to suppress everything you know to be true. And I, I think we do that though, don't we? We know that temptation has a satanic origin. We know it leads to destruction, but you have to suppress both of those things if you then want to go with it. But we manage to do that sometimes. Well, here are the same steps that we take, I think. We gather a crowd, 400 men. All these people agree. It seems so reasonable. Here are even these professors of theology who agree. Safety in numbers. Uh, we avoid those who will challenge us. 
we get the yes men, um, or we pressurize them to conform, or we persecute them. Uh, We ignore the spiritual realities. And then finally, let's read on from verse 29. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. There's the decision made. Shall we go or not? Well, they decide to go. They went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will enter the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal robes. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. I find this. You see why I said that Jehoshaphat is quite gullible. <laughs> so the king of Israel disguised himself went into battle, and Jehoshaphat's like, okay. So, I mean, so here is Jehoshaphat with a big sort of target costume, effectively. <laughs> and here's Ahab in disguise. But here's the question. Why wear a disguise? If you think you're going to win, then go into battle dressed as the king. If you think you're going to lose, don't go into battle but a disguise, it's like a trying to, a sort of hedged bet. It's like, I know God said this, and he might be right, and so I need to somehow outwit God's prophecy, so maybe a disguise will work. See, it's a sort of, it's a halfway house that only the person whose conscience nags at them would do. And I think, again, that is the, the backsliding believer, isn't it? I mean, non-Christian doesn't bother with a disguise. They just go for it in a brazen way. Um, and the uh, and the person walking with the Lord doesn't go there at all. But the half-hearted backslider, they try to go halfway. <clears throat> well, the king of Aram had ordered his 32 chariot commanders, don't fight with anyone, small or great, except the king of Israel. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat with his big target costume, they thought this must be the guy. So they turned to attack him. But when Jehoshaphat cried out in his southern accent. They thought, oh no, it's not him. The chariot commander saw it wasn't the king of Israel and stopped pursuing him. But someone drew his bow at random and the arrow went off at a funny angle and managed to hit the king of Israel between the sections of his armour. So it's a random straight arrow that exactly manages to go just into the armour. The king told his chariot rider driver, wheel round and get me out of the fighting. I've been wounded. All day long the battle raged. The king was propped up in his chariot facing the Arameans. The blood flowed from his wound onto the floor of the chariot and that evening he died. As the sun was setting, a cry spread through the army, every man to his town, every man to his land. The king died and was brought to Samaria. They buried him there. They washed the chariot out of pool in Samaria where the prostitutes bathed and the dogs licked up his blood as the word of the Lord had declared. Well, like, obviously. I mean, what what outcome were you expecting? I mean, that's what God had said. He prophesied through Elijah, actually, that Ahab would die and be licked up by dogs. Um, How someone dies in one, one, two kings is the kind of measure of whether they're good or bad kings. So the best thing that can happen to you is you can be, you can sleep with your father's, um, in the family tomb, that's really good. And the worst thing that can happen to you is dogs can eat you. And um, Elijah says that dogs will eat him, and, and they do. Um, Micaiah says, you'll lose the battle against Ramoth Gilead, and he does. Micaiah said, all Israel will be scattered like sheep without a shepherd. You know, you're the shepherd, you're the king, and they won't have a king. They'll, they'll all go back, to ho- back home, and they do. I mean, everything happens exactly as God said, but like obviously, because that, that's the point of this chapter, that in the end, well, truth is true. I mean, what you would like to be true doesn't become true because you'd like it to be true. It's just an, it's a delusion. Um, and so we stick it into the big story of one and two kings. God says judgment's coming, and that's true doesn't matter if you would prefer to think that there wasn't going to be a judgment or you'd like to think that there isn't a hell or you'd like to think that everyone will be saved in the end or you'd like to think that the world will just go on as it has before. I mean, all these, they're just delusions because God said that he's fixed a day in which he'll judge the world with justice and he will. So the lesson of 1 Kings 22, I think, is wishful thinking doesn't change the truth. 
but then more briefly, and I think this is the most, I mean, it's, I say it's the most comedy story. It's kind of darkly comedic. I mean, you know, it's tragic, but it's, it's tragic in a kind of black comedy kind of way. Um, we'll pick up from chapter 22, verse 51, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Ahaziah, son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. He reigned over Israel for two years. It's a clue there that it's not going to go very well. Not a very long reign. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord because he followed the ways of his father and mother, his father Ahab, his mother Jezebel, and the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Remember, he's the one who built the golden calves in Dan and Bethel. He caused Israel to sin. He served and worshipped Baal. He aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, just as his father had done. After Ahab's death, 2 Kings chapter 1, after Ahab's death, Marab rebelled against Israel. Now Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and injured himself. So he's kind of fallen out the window, basically, and he's um, very injured. He sent messengers saying to them, go and consult Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, to see if I'll recover from this injury. Wow. Okay, this, that, this is the king of Israel. He's got injured. He wants to go to see the doctor. Where, which, where do you go to the doctor? Oh, let's go and ask Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron. Um, I love the, the maximally passive-aggressive <laughs> response of Elijah. The angel of the Lord sent Elijah the Tishbite, go and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, here's the passive aggressive question, is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going off to consult Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? I love that. Is it, I mean, you know, it's, it's phrased as a question, but it's obviously a statement, isn't it? He's saying, look, the true God is the God of Israel. What are you going, doing going to a fake God? But he just puts it as a question. Oh, I wonder why you'd be travelling so far all the way to Ekron. Isn't there any kind of God around here? For example, the actual true God of Israel. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will not leave the bed you're lying on. You will certainly die. So Elijah went. Okay, so again, we've got a word of judgment has been pronounced from God. Well, you know the big theme when God says something, it's going to happen. When God announces judgment, judgment's going to come. So God's announced it, you're going to die. But um, it could be quite a short chapter, but it's quite a long chapter because of what happens next. Because Ahaziah does many things to try to stop God's word. God's announced it. Um, the question of the last chapter was, can you overcome God's word with wishful thinking? And the answer is, no, you can't. Uh, the question of this chapter is, can you overcome God's word by power um, and strength? And the answer is, no, you can't. Verse 5, the messengers returned to the king. He asked them, why have you come back? Or, to paraphrase, how come you're back so early? You know, after all, Ekron's quite a long way away, but you're back already. I was expecting you to be a bit longer. Well, oh, a man came to meet us, they said. You know, we got intercepted. And he said to us, go back to the king who sent you and tell him, this is what the Lord says. Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're sending messengers to consult Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you will not leave the bed you're lying on. You will certainly die. Now, at this point, the king goes, here we go. What kind of man was it who came to meet you, he said. Oh, well, he, they said he had a garment of hair and a leather belt round his waist. The king said... That was Elijah, that was. I mean, it's like, I guess he knows about Elijah, right? Because his dad was the famously evil Ahab who spent his whole life at loggerheads with Elijah. And Elijah also has the advantage of having a very distinctive signature outfit. <laughs> so when he said, oh, you know, he was about so high and he wore a well, camel's hair outfit with a leather belt. Oh, yeah. I know who that is. That was Elijah the Tishbite. So what do you do at this point? Now, well, you could think, well, Elijah the Tishbite, that's the prophet of the actual God who sent fire from heaven on Mount Carmel to light a barbecue and predicted the death of my father, and he was right. Oh, I probably should take him quite seriously. 
No, no, that isn't the response of Ahaziah. Instead, Ahaziah, brilliantly, sent to Elijah a captain with company of 50 men, a sort of demi-centurion. The captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on top of a hill, and said to him, man of God, the king says, come down. Now, I suggest this is not an invitation to dinner. An invitation to dinner requires, you know, a messenger. But when you send 50 soldiers... It's a bit more sinister. Come down. Elijah answered the captain, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. I mean, you should have known, really, because, I mean, God is already answered by fire on Mount Carmel and destroyed the prophets of Baal. And you haven't learnt your lesson so what do you think the king's going to do at this point? Oh, well, I'm in a losing wicket here against the God of Israel, the true God, who can send fire from heaven. I better repent. Now, here's a better plan. Verse 11. At this, the king sent to Elijah another captain with his 50 men. A brilliant plan, Asa. You've got to love this plan. The captain said to him, man of God, this is what the king says, come down at once. If I'm a man of God, Elijah replied wearily, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. So, can you guess what's happening next? Oh yes, brilliant. You know, if you've got a brilliant plan, don't divert from it. You know, just <laughs> keep rolling it out again. So the king sent a third captain with his 50 men. This third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these 50 men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men. And it's obvious, Elijah, to every one of us that the God of heaven is the real God. It's just my master is a bit slow catching on. And <laughs> please have mercy on me. She's a, a bit like a Rahab character, isn't he? You know, she knows that God is the true God and judgment's coming against her city. Please have mercy on me. I'm changing sides. I'm with you. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Don't be afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went down with him to the king. So um, Ahab, sorry, not Ahab, Ahaziah, Ahab's son, Ahaziah has gone to a lot of trouble to get Elijah, the man of God, to come down off the mountain. He's lost 102 soldiers. He finally gets um, Elijah there in front of him. For what? 16, he told the king, this is what the Lord says, is it because there's no God in Israel for you to consult that you've sent messengers to consult Baalzebub, the king of Ekron? Because you've done this, you'll never leave the bed you're lying on, you will die. So he died. <laughs> I mean, which we knew back in verse 3. And which Ahaziah knew back in verse 6. So you know, what have we achieved? Like precisely nothing. This whole loss of the army, all these military manoeuvres, only to discover that God's word is what he told you it was, some verses earlier, and it's going to be true. Um, if you've got the handout, and um, please, I'd love you to see this, because I've sort of set it out for you. The way it's crafted, I mean, it is an absolutely brilliant piece of writing, and it's just full of sort of little um, jokes and devices. And I, I just want to show you a couple of them. Um, did you notice that we get to hear the message three times? Is it because there's no God in Israel that you've gone to Baal Ekron, the God, of, the, God, the God of Ekron? Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to consult Baal Ziba, the God of Ekron? And then a pause with all the military manoeuvres. And then again, is it because there's no God in Israel? That you've... Three times we hear God's word. Three times it's matched three military manoeuvres. So it's God's word times three versus military power times three. But God's word wins. And each time God's word is true, each time the military manoeuvre is pointless. But there's also a lot of going up and coming down. And we, uh, some of it is, um, 
is masked in our translation, but you get some of it. Verse 3, Elijah is told, go up and say, literally, you shall not come down from your bed to which you've gone up. And then the king's messengers report that a man came up and said, you will not go down from the bed in which you've gone up. And then a captain went up and said to Elijah, come down. Elijah said, let fire come down, and fire came down. A second captain said, man of God, come down. Elijah said, let fire come down, and fire came down. A third captain went up and said, please don't let fire come down. And the angel of the Lord says, it's safe for you to go down. So Elijah went down, and Elijah said to the king, you will not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you'll surely die. It's, it's, I mean, it's kind of comedy. Um, and the point is that what God brings down will come down, and what God lifts up will go up, and human pride will be squished, and the Lord alone will be exalted, and God's word will come true, and you can't stop it with wishful thinking. Um, and you can't stop it with military power. Um, a little summary and then a final postscript about bald men, which I, I couldn't resist for obvious reasons. Okay, so here we go. Ramoth Gilead is the test. Shall we go, Micaiah, or give it a rest? The others all said what we want to be true. Only a pessimist would listen to you. So off to the battle Ahab goes in disguise, but God's word always comes to pass, and so of course he dies. His son is just as awful when lying in bed sick. He sends the ball of Ekron, but his men return too, sick, too quick. For they were intercepted by a man of hairy gown who told them there's no chance at all your king is coming down. Um, thank you, that's it. Um, and... <laughs> You get the whole thing on Friday if you stay to the end. Okay, and then finally, just look at the end of chapter, 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're going to meet Elisha very quickly. 2 Kings chapter 2. I'll read from verse 18. When they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? The people of the city, the people of Jericho, said to Elisha, look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt in it, saying, this is what the Lord says, I've healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. Um, that's amazing. And the most amazing thing about it is the place where it happens. There's a toxic water supply. Elisha miraculously cures it, but it's at Jericho. Do you remember? Cursed before the Lord is the one who rebuilds Jericho. He rebuilt, he'll lay its foundation at the cost of his firstborn. Um, he'll lay it at the cost of his youngest. He'll set up its gates according to the word spoken by Joshua. And that comes true, and there's a tragedy in Jericho. But now, Elisha, this cursed city, he brings salvation. That's very surprising. We'll come to that more tomorrow. But then, um, verse 23. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. Why is Bethel famous? I've mentioned it a couple of times before today. Golden calves, exactly. It's where the shrine is to the fake god. From there, Elijah went up to Bethel. He was walking along the Lord. Some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, baldy, they said. Get out of here, baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called a curse on them in the, in the name of the Lord. Two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there to return to Samaria. And um, People really struggle with this because it, it seems so brutal. Um, and, you know, aren't these just children and how awful and, you know, how can a, a man of God do this? Um, just a couple of comments. Um, firstly, I mean, young men, I don't think children, I think just um, angry young men. And not just jeering at someone for being bald, but dishonouring a prophet. The, these are people at Bethel involved in idolatry and when they see the prophet of the true God, they reject him and they jeer at him. And 
he's an assassin. And it is shocking what happens. I'm not denying that. But again, I kind of want to say, what, what did you expect? I mean, God says there's, there's Hazael, king of Syria, and Jehu, king of Israel, and Elisha, uh, the son of Shabbat of um, Abel Mahola. They're going to come and kill everyone. So when Elisha comes and kills 42 people, you think, well, well of course. I mean, that, that's what his job is. He's bringing judgment against apostasy in Israel. It's very unsurprising, I think, actually. And yet, the very surprising thing is that the assassin goes and brings healing at Jericho. Because I, I thought he was meant to... I mean, the, the bear's thing is the, is the unsurprising thing. The Jericho is the shocking thing. How come the assassin is saving people? And that is a trailer for Thursday, because there's a lot more of that coming. It, we're expecting it to be really bad... But then there's a real twist in the story. And Elisha's got some very surprising, very wonderful things to do. Let's pray as we close. Father, thank you for showing us today in, in various ways that what you say is going to happen. And we, we kind of know that at one level. And yet we can still be foolish in rejecting what we know to be true. Father, sometimes we think that wishful thinking... Um, can triumph and what we would like to be the case can win over what is actually the case. Sometimes we imagine that earthly powers might divert you or over, overwhelm you. And Lord, thank you for showing us in these chapters that actually your word is unstoppable and that when you announce judgment, it is going to come. And so the only safe response is to, like this captain of his 50 men, is to turn to you and call for mercy to seek refuge in your grace, to repent. And so, Father, in respect of your final prophecy, that you will judge the world by a man you've appointed, and of this you've given proof by raising him from the dead, help us not to doubt that, Lord, not to mock or scoff at the promise of his coming, but to know that if you said it, it will happen. Judgment cannot be averted and therefore the only safe response is to repent, to take refuge in, in you. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you.